Uh, it is such an extreme pleasure for me to uh, be able to introduce our guest tonight, um, D. Michael Quinn. He and I go way back. I don't even know how many years. Do you? Before you even started spelling your name with a C. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell that story, but uh, I think it was in our pre-earth life. And he says, I want to write books. And they go, well, I want to sell them. So that's when we started this whole thing, this whole scam. Um, Mike, uh, Michael Quinn has um, established himself as perhaps uh, no other Mormon historian in quite the same way. Uh, and as you already know, um, uh, he has won multiple awards uh, for for his books. Um, this, the one that just came out that we've all been waiting for for about what 17 years or what is it? <laughs> I don't know how long it's been. It's been a long time. Um, the Mormon hierarchy, wealth, and corporate power. The third, in third and final in the trilogy. Um, that has been, to say that it's been long anticipated really would be an understatement. Um, and this, it's like before we got started uh, tonight, <laughs> you know, we were talking about the crowd size. Have you ever known a politician to talk about crowd size? <laughs> Just wait till I tell about how many were here tonight when I tell this story. Um, the largest crowd for any author signing in history, at least at this store. Um, but Mike says, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> sex and violence really sell books, and so does money. So um, I don't think this has all three, does it? No. No. Uh, <laughs> um, but this, this book, uh, I can only imagine what what Mike has uh, put into it in terms of blood, sweat, and tears, and time, and effort. Um, and I was going to say I should give a nod to the those who have worked with him as well, because they probably deserve an award too, right, Mike? Working with you? At Signature Books, um, the, the proud publisher of this book. Mike has done a number of other books. One of the better known, uh, I mean, he's done biography of J. Reuben Clark, and we have uh, a lot of the books. We have the previous two volumes uh, in, the, in the Mormon Hierarchy series, Early Mormonism and the Magic World, excuse me, and the Magic World View. Um, this has been, I would assume, I don't know if somebody from Signature could tell me, but I would assume it's one of the best sellers of their list over the years. Uh, that was a transformative experience for me to read this book because um, I was caught up in the, a lot of the drama of the Mark Hoffman case and uh, there's so much in this book that is, is relevant to that, to that story, that very strange and tragic story. Um, but um, I'm not going to take any more time. You all know who Michael Quinn is and and we're so grateful that, that you've come tonight to hear him. I am curious, so how many are here for the first time at Benchmark Books? Great. We really appreciate your coming. Uh, we're, we don't often you know, cram you in like this, but, but we're very grateful that you've made the effort and taken the time to come. And um, just for those of you who have come in just uh, recently here, uh, Mike's going to take probably 40-45 minutes to speak. We're going to have ample time for questions and answers. Um, so be thinking up some good ones for him. And then we're going to invite you to put up your chairs so we can clear the aisleways. And then if you'd come up to the front and make your purchases either at the front desk here or if you just want to do by credit card, we'll be out in the hallway. And Mike will be happy to sign books for you. Uh, like I said, we've got most of his titles, if not all, uh, that he's published. And, um, and then we've got some wonderful 
uh, refreshments out in the hallway. Um, if you could go out there uh, afterwards and and have those, and and then we'll just be so grateful to have had a wonderful evening together. Uh, the last thing I want to say is not only have I and so many admired Michael Quinn for his uh, incredible scholarship uh, and attention to detail. I mean, this book's got three chapters and I think, is it 21 appendices? Yeah. So you, you want to talk about detail. And uh, now I know it looks like you're getting cheated uh, on, your, on the size, but they've used a different paper, I guess, because this has as many pages as the other volumes are close. There's about 600 pages here. So, but it's a lot thinner volume. But you're not getting any less. Um, but I am uh, proud to, to call uh, Mike Quinn my friend, and I'd like to now have him talk to us. Uh, either way, if you have it on the belt. There we go. I hope I have Let's make sure that. Can you all hear him? Okay. Testing. Everyone can hear at the back. Okay. Good. Um, I will maybe take less than 45 minutes, but. Uh, I, I can't promise because I do tend to run off at the mouth. Um, it's in, in more than one way it's embarrassing to talk about how long I've been working on this book, but I think it's necessary for you to understand not only the process, but my process and, and how this book came to be in a, in a form that I did not anticipate at all. Uh, for a long time that I worked on a part of the book. Um, it book the book actually begins with a, a graduate seminar that I took at the University of Utah. It began in the fall of, of uh, 1971. And uh, it was a two-term course on historical methods. And the approach uh, and the course was taught by Davis Bitton who was a distinguished professor of Renaissance uh, history and Reformation at the U of U at that time, but had a great interest in publishing, and he continued to publish more and more about Mormon history. But in this course, we were being taught what at that time was called, called the new history, and it was what the uh, academic profession was beginning to recognize as a, uh, a non-traditional direction for professional history, history that was written by academic historians, um, some well-established, others just up and coming. And the idea was that the first term, we would read one or two books in each of these new dimensions that history was um, taking within the Academy of the United States. Um, in, in France, it had actually begun significantly earlier. But uh, among the, the items or the areas that were part of the new history were women's history uh, and uh, the emphasis on the daily lives, not only of women, that was one major a aspect, but also common people's experience. And uh, the experience sometimes recorded in journals, in correspondence, and in many other sources um, of, of common people as far back as the historical record allowed. And uh, those were two major areas where we had readings. Another area was demography, which is looking at large populations in the way that sociologists and political scientists often had done, but looking at them in a historical sense, which social scientists and political science, uh, scientists had rarely done. 
they had looked at snapshots in time uh, of large populations, and the new history adopted demography at looking at large populations. When I say large, that's a relative term too, because uh, some of the best demographic studies have been of villages uh, over time and their population characteristics, how they maintained certain characteristics, how those characteristics changed for a village or for a town or for a city over time. Uh, and demography has uh, extended, historical demography has extended um, in many directions uh, in terms of location and in terms of the time period that was covered. Uh, and one uh, that in particularly intrigued me was psychobiography. And we had uh, one of the books that we read for psychobiography was Young Man Luther. And I chose that as the reading for uh, that section that uh, in Davis Bitt introduced because I was interested in, in the Renaissance and Reformation. And uh, that was an eye-opening approach to the historical past using ideas, theories, and uh, approaches of psychiatry and psychology to uh, understand and help uh, the public understand a historical character in a different way. Uh, and so that I found very intriguing, even though I didn't have the, the skills to pursue that, it, it was intriguing to me, and I read several and encouraged other people to follow that. Um, in fact, one of my the students in that course, I've, as we were uh, talking about what to do for our, our papers that we were going to do for the course in the second term, I recommended this one student who was also a, 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 a psychology minor to uh, do a psychobiography of Brigham Young, and I gave him some suggestions of, of uh, sources, Brigham Young's own journals. And particularly, the dreams he, re he recorded. Because anyone worth his salt knows that Freudians love dreams, and, and most psychiatrists still find them intriguing, although not as, as um, determinative as Freud thought they were. But um, he chose to write on something else that was non-Mormon. And I thought, well, that's a missed opportunity. And I don't think anyone else has really <coughs> analyzed. I, even John Turner's wonderful biography doesn't spend a lot of time on those dreams. And there is a record of them not only in his own diaries, but in the office diaries of, uh, that clerks kept. Because he would come in and say, I had a wonderful dream last night, or a strange dream. And they would write it down. So there are decades worth of Brigham Young's dreams that would provide the fodder for a great psychobiography. Uh, then the, the methodology in the new history that intrigued me was uh, pioneered in the English language by a man named uh, Louis Namier. And he was, had been knighted, so he was Sir Louis Namier. And he uh, wrote a book about the characteristics biographical characteristics of the English Parliament at the uh, accession of uh, George III. And I read this and was just fascinated with how he presented and how he treated a group institutionally defined as if that group were a dynamic living entity. And he wanted to understand, all right, this group has been defined institutionally uh, by Parliament and, it, and the appointments and or elections and or the heritage that created the Parliament. And, uh, and he wanted and presented these detailed analyses of the background, the wealth, the military experience, the family connections, the political activities, uh, on a, a variety of, of tub topics about this, this group. And then the second book that we read about this, this approach, which he called prosopography, which was a, an ancient uh, method of, of looking at elite groups, but uh, not often 
pronounced correctly and, and not often used today, but I used it as a, as a title uh, in one of my uh, submissions academically. The other book that is group biography, which is uh, the more common term for this, was written about a, <coughs> an institutionally non-defined group. And this was the Florentine uh, elite in the uh, Renaissance. And the uh, author <coughs> determined who was in this group in terms of wealth that could be assessed by the uh, taxation records that were available for Florence, and also political power. And once he had defined this group in terms of essentially political science and, and sociology ways of defining elites uh, in terms of uh, the position did not apply here, and that was the, one, uh, the approach that Namir used. But he used it in terms of wealth and the exercise of power, both uh, monetary as well as political wealth. And then once he had this group, he analyzed them in the same way that Namir had uh, of an institutionally defined group. To treat this group, even though it was more amorphous than the uh, very uh, strictly defined membership in the parliament, because they were connected in power and wealth, he could, uh, yeah, the author felt, provide this image or this picture for the readers of what were the characteristics of this group as if you were doing a biography of an individual. And this approach fascinated me so much that Davis Bitton had us choose one of the approaches uh, that we had done readings in and lectures in during the first term to devote the majority of the second term to preparing a paper of 30 to 50 pages using one of these approaches that we had studied and uh, read examples of. Well, the one that I chose was group biography. I mean, they all fascinated me, but this was the one that I had never even imagined, uh, whereas I'd read Freud and, and uh, Jung and, and others in an early, earlier time. And so approaches in, in psychobiography were not that much of a stretch for me. But the, the approach of looking at a group as if it were a, an organic whole really intrigued me. So once I told him I was going to do my paper on that, then he wanted me to isolate it. And, uh, and I thought for a while, well, I could do the Utah legislature. No, boring. And then I thought the uh, U.S. Senate I could do uh, during a particular time period. And I thought, well, that's, that's a common, uh, I mean, other people have done similar things. And then it occurred to me, oh, there's a group I've already been doing research on, and they're defined in, in institutional ways, and uh, I already have, you know, I have a good sense of, of many of the characteristics that they have. And so I chose to look at the general authorities of the LDS Church. And uh, typical of the kind of academic... Um, I'll call it arrogance, because I think that's the case. Um, I chose a century of looking at their lives and for this 30 to 50 page paper. And so I decided that I was going to look at them from 1830 to 1930s. And I chose a limited number of things that I was interested in for the paper. I, would, I chose where they were born and where they grew up the educational background they had, and their religious affiliation, because all of them at the first, and some later on, had converted to Mormonism before they became leaders of its highest church. So, this is where this book and the Mormon hierarchy series began as a, as a term paper uh, for a two-term course at the University of Utah. And then, as many of us in this course, and I think Davis Bitton intended, used that paper as a springboard for uh, the thesis that we would write 
for uh, a master's degree at the U. And, uh, and so that became my topic, and I expanded somewhat the, uh, the analysis for this group, but I still maintained that it was uh, covering a 100-year period and dealing with around 124 men. And, uh, and then that became my, my master's thesis. And then I transferred after completing that in August at the all-night all session and handing it to the chair of my department two days before the final oral exam. He was very indulgent. Uh, then I went to Yale and um, started a, a course in, in uh, a doctoral program in American history and specifically with an emphasis on Western American history. I need to say that I came late to an academic study of history. I had started reading academic history when I was nine, and uh, at, at the time I emphasized biographies, and so I went to the library one day and carted out um, footnoted biographies of Washington, Pre uh, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. And then I expanded my study from biographies of great white men to uh, war. I was very interested in war, and so I read about the Civil War, and I read about um, uh, and many, most of this was uh, footnoted academic things that I was reading uh, about the pre-Civil War South. And then uh, World War II fascinated me more than any other American conflict. And so I began reading many different kinds of things about World War II, uh, memoirs, uh, academic studies, and uh, autobiographies. And that had consumed my interest as a, um, as a fledgling hobby until I was 16. And then when I was 16, I started reading, in addition to what I'd already been reading, um, Mormon history. And I was reading what was available in print. And then uh, when I went to BYU as a freshman, I was planning on becoming an English major and ultimately becoming an English professor. And I had done so much reading in academic history that I thought that I, you know, it would not be useful for me uh, in a minor to choose history. And so I choose, chose one that I knew almost nothing about and I thought would be both informative and interesting, and, uh, and that was philosophy, and so I minored in philosophy. And in history, as an undergraduate, I took only one elective course beyond those that were required for graduation, and that course was in uh, Renaissance Italy in particular, but it also dealt with the Renaissance uh, in Europe. And uh, the reading list I will never forget. The teacher was D. Lamar Jensen. And the reading list went on for something on the order of 15 to 20 pages. And I, uh, I was not always um, anxious to do a lot of reading for a course that I was going to be only one of six usually that I took at BYU a semester. Um, but this one I, I stayed with, and I didn't. Uh, I dropped out of an uh, out of a uh, anthropology introduction for the uh, for the reason that I gave him, the guy who was teaching it gave me a 15 or 20 page reading list, and I just said goodbye, and signed out, and did not take any <laughs> anthropology courses uh, as an undergraduate for that reason. But I stuck with this course on the Renaissance, and it was it was mind opening, eye opening for me. But it did not encourage me to switch to history, and that was the only elective course I took. So both at the U and at my doctoral program at, uh, at Yale, I was playing catch-up because everyone in those graduate programs, my master's program and my PhD program, had had an undergraduate background in, in history. And that's very significant to try to jump in to history as a, um, as a new field, completely new. 
And so I was doing a lot of catch-up reading and understanding, and that's why this course in historical methods was such a powerful course to me, because for the first time in my life, even though I'd been reading academic history, uh, I learned approaches and questions and, uh, um, and pitfalls uh, about the discipline that I, as a, as a reading for just pleasure, as a hobby, I'd never grasped, and uh, and so when I went to Yale, that was a remarkable uh, continuation of that exposure, really for the first time to the field of history and academics and interpretation that built on the kind of, of uh, gratitude that I owe University of Utah and Davis Bitten for giving me as a um, starting master student just fresh out of the military during the Vietnam War. Um, when I went to Yale, I was hoping to reduce the amount that I had to borrow. And, uh, and so I really wanted to continue my hierarchy study for my PhD. And uh, my advisor there, uh, a, an, a, an internationally renowned expert on the American West, Howard R. Lamar, I uh, said that he, he thought it would be foolish for me to choose any other topic for my dissertation than to continue my work on the Mormon hierarchy during that same time period with that same 124 men, but to expand and also uh, expand in the topics that I had chosen as a master's thesis, but also expand in the depth that I was able to cover them. And uh, so 33 months after I entered BYU, I walked away with a PhD degree. And, uh, and three months after that, I had a position at BYU. I had started as a part of this study in 1975. I completed the PhD dis uh, dissertation and graduated in May 1976. But in 1975, I started uh, intensive work on business in particular, not so much finance, but business. And I was interested in the business activities, corporate as well as partnership, as well as unincorporated, um, commercial and business activities of the, this group of 124 men. And, uh, and so in the process, I was looking in detail at records that would define their management of companies. And so I went to the uh, Utah State Archives to look at the records of the only counties in Utah that had preserved more than corporation documents of um, incorporation and then uh, amendments to incorporation. All the other counties in Utah had destroyed those old records that I found so necessary, which were records of oaths of office for persons elected as, as uh, officers or directors of these corporations. And uh, from the research I've done, I think every other corporation, I mean, pardon me, every other county in the United States has also destroyed those records of, uh, of oath, uh, oaths of office that would to give you over the, the, what had at one time been a, a corporate file the full management of those companies. And I could only do that with these we annual filings of, of, uh, of elections in the counties of Salt Lake and, and uh, Weber and Utah County. Uh, it was time consuming uh, in, in uh, um, Salt Lake County. I went through nearly 13,000 files on 13,000 uh, companies that included not only their corporations uh, in document documentation, but also all of these oaths of office. And some of those files were this thick, and others were just very thin. It varied depending on the longevity of the, of the company. And I did a similar thing in Utah County and in the, um, the county of, of uh, Weber. But uh, I 
had to put this aside when I started BYU. How many here have ever taught public school or college? Raise your hands, you long-suffering folks. Uh, for those who haven't had the experience, when you start teaching, and typically it's three to five courses a term, uh, you are basically, if you're lucky, two jumps ahead of your students in the preparation. And, that, and that's where I was. Sometimes I was only one jump, one <laughs> class meeting or course meeting ahead of the reading assignments that I had given them uh, in my reading of the, of the texts that were cited and then all the reading I needed to do to provide the additional supplemental material that I always felt was necessary to provide uh, in lectures rather than just rehashing what they were, were reading in the text that were assigned. So work on the, on the Mormon hierarchy in any respect and certainly on the business and, uh, side of it was just beyond the pale. It was not something I could do until the summer of 1977 and then I got a, uh, a grant from the National Endowment of Humanities to work full-time throughout the summer on this and so I went through county uh, courthouse uh, records in all the other counties of Utah that had, did not, had not kept their, their uh, election records, but did have incorporation documents, and I went through every one of those uh, chronologically down to the end of the year, 1932, in every county to find out uh, who were named as directors in the original documents that were filed. And then I went through all, through all the western states, uh, including Hawaii. Uh, I didn't go to, to Alaska because I didn't think there was much up there to find that would have involved the general authorities. But I went through all the other states as far as Texas and, and, um, and went through their corporate records. Uh, that was a wild summer of traveling. And I thought, having done that, that, during, uh, that during that whole summer, that I was going to be able to work at in my second year teaching at BYU uh, in a Tuesday-Thursday fashion when I wasn't teaching courses that I had already done the groundwork in, in preparing for that first year. I thought, well, I can, I can bring this to conclusion and maybe get a, a smooth and quick publication. Well, then within a month after I started my teaching my second year at BYU, I was assigned to write an authorized biography of the church experience of J. Reuben Clark, who had, was uh, at one time the Under Secretary of State and the Ambassador of the United States to Mexico. But for people in, in these parts, he was known primarily as the uh, counselor in the First Presidency from 1933 to 1961, and that was what I was emphasizing, his religious life, and church experience, and uh, his ad administrative importance. And I worked five years on that, and um, there was no way that I could continue working on the hierarchy while I was assigned to work on that, and they yanked me out of the classroom, and my poor students were uh, greeted with a wonderful replacement, uh, but uh, nonetheless, they were taken aback when they were uh, regarded as less important than this, uh, this assignment from uh, the, the administration to work on this authorized biography. So what the, down, the downside and the, the short form is that essentially I only work every two or about every two or three, no, not even three, usually two years on this business side of the the uh, study that I was doing about every every decade. I worked about two years in the 1980s and then about two years in the 1990s. And I had this very large appendix that I wanted to put into the study that I was publishing about the Mormon hierarchy. Uh, and uh, when I was submitting it to the, um, to the press, they had it uh, that it was work workable for them to edit and me to expand my coverage of the founding period, 
Joseph Smith's early life to the arrival of Brigham Young in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. And then I would do a second volume from 1848 to the, whatever year would be the year of publication. And in that, I just kept expanding. The more I researched, the more I expanded the coverage, the, the, um, the length of chapters, and the number of appendixes. And I didn't have a, a space in either volume for this, this appendix that I've been working on since 1975. And uh, I really was frustrated, but I was pleased that the origins of power and extensions of power had the coverage and the depth that they have. But all I could do uh, in relation to all the decades that I'd already worked on, and it was essentially two decades that I'd worked on this business, is, is, was in my biographical sketches at the end of each volume for the men who were called during that time period covered by the uh, two volumes, was to list uh, the names of the companies that they were involved in. And so there was a section of each biographical sketch that dealt with business. And um, I got exhausted after, by 1999. I, by the time uh, 1999 approached and Leonard Harrington died early that, that year, um, I had published four books in four years, and I just, I was beside myself with, with uh, exhaustion. And I was really on the verge, uh, and I'd been making this threat several times before that I was leaving Mormon history. And uh, Will Bagley interviewed me the night before I flew to Mexico in February of 1999, and I just told him, I'm done. I mean, this is it. I've, I've, I've done what I, not everything I wanted to, but I think I've done everything I have the energy to do. And I went down to Mexico and lived in Chiapas in the midst of, a, of an ethnic conflict in the, in the um, state, the lowermost state, of far the southernmost state of, of Mexico, which is 85% Maya. And it was a wonderful experience, and my ancestry was half Mexican, but my ancestry did not come from that area. It uh, came from Sinaloa, which you may recognize as a haven of the drug cartels now. But uh, it, uh, it also is a location of Mazatlan, which has been an American resort there in Sinaloa for many decades. Um, but it was an eye-opener for me, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed my experience living in Mexico for the discovery, but it was also, there were some hard experiences that I had while I was in Mexico, and a culture shock for a gringo like me, uh, who was a gringo Chicano, living in Mexico for the first time, and each state in Mexico is really like a different nation. They have their own traditions, their own cuisine, uh, in some cases their own form of language, and in, in uh, Chiapas, the, the uh, Amaya, 85% uh, of the chop, Chiapas, referred to all other Mexicans as Ladinos. And that was like calling them the N-word uh, for the Maya. Uh, and I wasn't even good enough to be a Ladino. I was lower than that. I was an, a gringo who was struggling to speak Spanish without a German accent. Um, which was the language I kept reverting to men mentally while I was doing these tutorials in Spain, Spanish. So it was a great experience, and I came back and, and uh, had a, an appointment at the University of Southern California for two years. But they weren't interested in Mormon history. They wanted me to write about what I'd published about in 1996, and that was same-sex relationships. And so I got a two-year appointment, and worked full-time at USC's uh, archive on GLBTI uh, experience, which is a massive archive. And so all of the guest lectures I gave related to what I had been working on for a number of years and continuing to intensely working on, work on in the archives at USC, and that was cross-cultural and historical uh, analysis and uh, understanding of uh, 
same-sex or complex sex relationships throughout the world. And so those were the lectures that I gave to a number of different kinds of class classes at USC for a two-year period. And it, was, it seemed as though I was never going to get back to Mormon history, which in some ways was okay, but in other ways I had this amount of work that I had done that I wanted to bring to fulfillment. So uh, beyond my expectation in the last year that I was at <coughs> USC in the spring of, of 2002, I got a phone call from Yale uh, and was informed that I had been chosen to receive a full ride fellowship at <coughs> Yale, including housing, everything except food and stamps, basically. Um, and uh, I, they wanted me to do work on Mormon history. And initially, I wanted to continue my work in, in um, doing a cross-cultural analysis of same-sex issues. And they obligingly agreed, if that's really what you want to do, Mike, that's not what you're a well-known expert on, but uh, if you want to, go ahead. You, you, this is whatever you want to do. But then, um, so much of what I was working on in sexuality in, in Victorian America and Victorian England, that was what I was planning to do, compare England and, and or the British Isles and, Ameri and uh, the Americas, or the America above uh, Mexico and below Canada. I kept running across a lot of references to polygamy. And the more I, I ran across those references, the more I wanted to explore polygamy. And eventually I decided I need to go back to what I've done so much research on. And so the last half of my year at Yale, I worked on Mormon polygamy. So that took me up to the year 2000. So I knocked on Signature Book's door and said, I really want you to publish this. This appendix has never been published, and the readers of the first two volumes are are uh, missing the advantage of having because they have the names of these companies and and not the historical sketches of at the time 900 companies, and that was the level of my research at the time that Extensions of Power came out. Um, and Ron Prittis, the uh, managing editor, said, well, this is a very interesting topic, but we don't publish appendixes. And you're going to have to publish a complete book, a real book, uh, not just an appendix where it's just one damn fact after another, uh, undigested. And I moaned and groaned and... and tried to uh, persuade all, with all my charms, which certainly had always worked with the general authorities, um, and they worked equally well with the, um, the editors at Signature Books. And so I was faced with either never publish this appendix or publish it as, as part of a real book. And then, uh, unbeknown to me, a man died that I'd known only a year and a half before his death, and he had left a bequest in his will for me to write his biography. And so, after I left Yale, I had that to work on, and I worked on that for four and a half years. And so finally, when I, it, long, long story, not reasonably short, but abbreviated, um, I began working full-time on this expanded version of business and finances in June. 2008, and I continued that work full time until uh, 2012, when I uh, delivered a manuscript book length to um, Ron Prittis at Yale, uh, at uh, well, no, at Signature Books, um, for the third volume of the Hierarchy series, and to indicate the extent of what I had been able to accomplish, even in the period that I was emphasizing that uh, this, this appendix that dealt with only up to 1933 of uh, uh, an un, un, I mean not unincreased number of men, the same number of men, that grew from the 900 companies that I had uh, had at the time the 
1997 book came out to 1800. Um, and so you're stuck with Appendix 5, which is about 280 pages long of that expanded uh, appendix that I am very grateful Ron uh, did not allow me to publish in early two, in the early 2000s is what I all, all that I had had as of 1997. Then, since I was publishing it in the 21st century, I thought it would be ridiculous for me not to bring my analysis up to the 21st century. And so I began doing what I had never done, and that was moving, looking at business beyond the 1980s and business and finance beyond the 1990s. Um, and it was a wonderful discovery. And uh, again, in many cases, things come to me as topics that I have written about or speeches that I have given because somebody invited me to do so. And in this case, it was not somebody inviting me, it was somebody saying, well, surely you're going to talk about the international church. And I'd never looked at, the, paid any attention to the international church. And this person said, I mean, I, I said to the person who mentioned it to me, well, I have no background in, in the international church, and there are more than 100 com companies that the, or countries, rather, that the church has established buildings and significant membership and temples in by the uh, 2008 when I was starting this. And they said, oh, well, these, these companies are rather countries. Almost all of them require annual reports from the church in those countries. And you can find those in English and French and Spanish and German <coughs> in whatever is the language of the, com of the country where the church is required, like all other nonprofits, to issue an annual financial report. And I, this was totally new to me. I had no knowledge of this whatever. And so I've identified, and, and my thank you in the acknowledgments by name only, um, some of the people, two, two of the people who, who um, mentioned this to me that I had no knowledge of. And so I began looking at those reports and decided that even though the French and German language and Spanish language <coughs> reports were important, that if I tried to translate them or have somebody translate them for me, I would immediately be questioned about the accuracy of my translating and understanding <coughs> the uh, accounting <coughs> terms in all these different languages. And so I decided that in order to avoid that kind of criticism, I would leave, limit myself to English language reports. And there were a lot of English language countries, but I found that it was not possible for me to get the reports of the 20th century from several of these, even though these reports were required by the countries and submitted. And so I was unable to get financial details from the Hong Kong uh, uh, principality, well not principality, but region of the PRC, uh, even though they called it a uh, financial report and I paid for the photocopying and, and mailing of it to me and I found it had no financial information, even though it was called financial report. And I think I'd been spoiled by this time. Uh, it had some financial information, but nothing like the detailed reports submitted in English by Canada, or by the church in Canada, and by the church in the United Kingdom. I was also, I tried to get uh, all the third world countries that I could that gave their reports in English. And I initially had promises from Ga the Ghana Republic, the Ga well, from the corporation divisions in the, the governments of Ghana and Nigeria that they would give me photocopies of the reports they required and had received and I never did. So I just have to acknowledge that those were uh, sought for but not received and in the uh, Republic of South Africa it was a similar situation. Uh, they had only one report and they put uh, that in line on the line in part and they weren't willing to give me the full report for reasons I'm not sure of. So I referred to the, in, in a paragraph, to the South African report, but uh, it does not, did not include it. So what the book analyzes in detail 
are the financial reports in the 20th century from New Zealand, <coughs> pardon me, Australia, Tonga, the Philippines, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And the details vary uh, according to the requirements of each country. The reports in, from Canada and the United Kingdom were the most detailed. Uh, but all of them provided details of tithing received and of the supplements that they received from church headquarters in Utah and their expenditures. And so I did a longitudinal study, in other words, a study of year by year where I could uh, comparing each of these countries uh, with uh, the others uh, with reference to the LDS Church and its operations and its finances over time. But it, I couldn't do it uh, on, a on an equal basis, pardon me, because some of those countries uh, had given annual reports and had provided to me annual reports from 2000 to 2010. Others didn't have them available for me until, say, the 2004, uh, and one, I think, was as late as 2007. So I, I had a, a, an uneven uh, ability to compare and contrast, but I did what I could, and I found some extraordinary uh, uh, trends, and I'll share those with you at the, at the end, but I first I want to talk about the surprise that I had in, in uh, looking at the details of, of the financial compensations given to the highest leaders of the LDS Church from the 1830s to the 21st century. And what I found is that for the most part, Brigham Young and his son John W. being glaring exceptions, the general authorities did not um, profit from the church. They, in many cases, and one of the first appendixes that I have in the book shows the general authorities whose wealth on a year-by-year -year basis was less than the uh, non-general authorities in Salt Lake County, and I was able to do that for a period of decades. And then I also had the advantage of looking at the year-by-year uh, -year, uh, tax reforms from Kirtland, Ohio, when it was church headquarters, and from Nauvoo, Illinois, when it was church headquarters. And, uh, and I was and I, in going through those, I separated out all the non-general authorities from those who were general authorities and calculated the numbers separately so that I could compare what the general authorities had to the non-general authorities, which included non-Mormons, but also included Mormons who were rank and file and who were not serving at those highest levels in the LDS Church. And then I had the advantage of having access to probate records. But the problem with comparing probate records is if somebody died in 1850 and had a probate total assessment, and I like to uh, deduct their, their death-related uh, debts, uh, debt-related, death debts. So that would be like funeral expenses and, and hospitalization expenses from the inventory given by appraisers. But even having that, you can't compare dollars from somebody's estate in 1850 to somebody's estate in 1860 because the value of the dollar varies. Uh, in, and it's certainly going down to the period I wanted to, down to the 1980s, um, you can't do it because the variation in the value of the dollar varies so dramatically over time. So what I did is I correlated all of the, the assessments of estates from the earliest that I found in 1840 to the last available in 1988. And I, I, I converted those, those values to $2,010 so that I could compare the wealth of all the general authorities on an equal measure no matter when they die. And I had to stop in the 1880s because Utah law changed in the 1880s. And some people, when I have read this in the book, I've gathered from online comments, think it was only the, to the benefit of general authorities. No, uh, Utah law 
uh, exempted everyone who died from having a, a complete probate assessment of their estate. And uh, they, the Utah law allowed what was called informal probate for those that went through probate, but then also those who went through uh, and beginning in the 1970s, living, uh, living trusts were exempt from any kind of publicly available uh, uh, inventory that had typically been required of anyone who had significant assets at death. And so the, from the 1970s onward, the numbers of general authorities then <laughs> was able to assess their wealth at death declined dramatically because of these changes in Utah law where virtually all of them died and, and had their probates. But what I found was, to me, stunning. I had expected that all of the presidents of the church would be at the top and that everyone else would, with variations, because I knew there were variations, but with variations, the trend would be that all the lower general uh, ranking, general authorities and people sometimes hate that idea of rank, but it's, it's the world the, the hierarchy lives in. But going in and out of doors is an order of seniority and elevators and up and downstairs. I mean, seniority is very important and I call it rank uh, rather than, than seniority. Um, it wasn't the case. What I found was that uh, two uh, consecutive presidents of the church, George Albert Smith, who served from 1945 to 1951, David O. McKay, who served from 1951 to his death in 1970, when I compared their estates on this equalized basis in 2010 dollars, I found that approximately 50 lower ranking general authorities died with greater wealth than these two presidents of the church. And that just stunned me because these presidents of the church were getting corporate benefits as well from their directorships and their, their uh, officerships in church-owned <coughs> for-profit businesses. And I just expected that this would uh, automatically, the combination of that would autom with uh, the, uh, the salaries, which allowance is the preferred term um, by church LDS headquarters, but it's also a salary, um, that the combination of corporate benefits and salaries would give, put the, the presidents of the church and their counselors consistently at the top, and that was not the case. And then I found out that in the 20th century, the uh, authorities, all the general authorities from the president of the church, and this was instituted in the mid-1960s by David O. McKay, they receive the same living allowance or salary remuneration on a monthly basis the president of the church as the most recent general authority who is serving 24-7, usually for life, um, then from the 1990s onward, uh, for some for a five-year period only, but during that five or six years, they also serve 24-7. Well, they all get the same, the amount, which I think is faith promoting um, to, to learn that it's no longer defined. Uh, they're, they're, living allowance is no longer defined by their seniority or their office. What stunned me, though, was that the document, that uh, letter, uh, internal document, that showed that the standardized uh, living allowance of the general authorities in 2014 was raised to $120,000 a year. The Canadian report to the Canadian government had to list what its employees received at highest levels, the highest paid employees, bureaucrats, the church speak is church administrators, mine is bureaucrats. The highest paid bureaucrat in Canada in uh, 2010, which is the last report I looked at, um, made more than double what the general authorities were receiving as a living allowance in 2014, and that was an increase in 2014. And no longer uh, since 1996 were the general authorities receiving the benefits of corporate directorships and officerships. 
um, in only about two cases, Bonneville International and um, Desert Management, maybe Desert Trust. Uh, members of the First Presidency have corporate board attend uh, officerships in those. The uh, glaring exception in terms of presiding quorums, which I call in the book echelons of the hierarchy, is the presiding bishopric, which from the very beginning it has uh, been a, a calling dealing with money and then businesses. And so those men are extensively involved in corporate uh, officership and corporate directorships, which in the normal run-of-the-mill uh, world, they receive significant uh, fees from. So they have a, a, an advantage. But other than that, and I didn't know this, and I wish I'd thought of putting it in the book, of comparing 21st century remuneration, living allowance, salary for the general authorities to the CEOs of nonprofit companies in the United States, <laughs> particularly charitable ones. And it was a huge oversight. I gave this, this presentation in San Francisco a week or more than a week ago. And Bob Rees, who many, many of you know, uh, lives in the Bay Area, teaches at GTU at Berkeley. Um, he said, he raised his hand and said, you know, Mike, the president of the Red Cross gets a million two a year in salary. And here we have, and by my measures, a, an organization that brings in, in tithing, 33 billion, with a B, a year in the 21st century, plus, depending on which of the historical trends you follow, uh, a minimum of 20 and a maximum of 45% in addition from commercial income. So if, by my, and I think it's a conservative read of the data, uh, about $50 billion a year. The highest CEO of that, of that organization receives one-tenth of what the CEO of a red charity the Red Cross receives. And that CEO of the Red Cross is in an eight to five job. Whereas the presidents of the church and their and particularly their their quorum of the twelve, it's basically twenty four seven for life. And they can get a three o'clock in the morning call. Uh, just like the White House can about an existential threat and uh, the president of the church or his counselors or the Quorum of the Twelve can get that kind of call about an existential uh, event involving missionaries, involving uh, an entire uh, group of thousands, perhaps more, members of the church in a citywide, region-wide disaster. And yet they give themselves, they determine the salaries, they give themselves one-tenth of what the highest bureaucrats in Canada are, are paid. And I cannot believe that the highest bureaucrats at LDS headquarters get paid any less because the dollar is within cents of equality between uh, Canada and the United States. And I, I quote from who used to be the CEO of, uh, or CFO rather, of church finance, and that's Alan Blodgett, and he came in in the, uh, 1965 as the comptroller of church finance. Then he became, within a few years, the director of the financial department, and then the last five years or so of his service up to 1985, he was the director of the investments department. And he said that as a bureaucrat, he was receiving significantly more income during his tenure than any of the general authorities, including the president of the church. Um, I find that faith promoting. The other issue, and I'll close with this, is that the LDS church subsidizes the international church to an amount that I would not have thought possible. Canada is the only country that hardly receives any, any subsidy above the tithing its local members can pay to pay for its expenses. 
Uh, there are years when Canada receives nothing from church headquarters, uh, other years when it's 1%, and uh, the most in the 20th century that I found up to 2010 was 6%. In, in the UK, where the church has had a uh, significant uh, presence since 1837, between 40 and 60 percent of this industrial country receives uh, of its expenditures have to be paid by the LDS church headquarters in Salt Lake City. In one year alone, 2006, LDS headquarters paid a subsidy or gave cash subsidy of nearly one billion dollars to the church in the United Kingdom. That's only in one country that year out of more than a hundred company or countries in the world where the church has significant buildings, temples, and large numbers of memberships. In the third world, Philippines is a good example. Um, 90 to 98 percent of their expenses have to be paid by church headquarters in Salt Lake City. Why? Because Filipino population generally, their income on average allows them to, to give one meal a day to each member of their family. They cannot pay out of the income that they get more for the chapels they worship in, for the temples that they go for these sacred ordinances of the temples. They cannot. And so the church pays up to 90 percent, to 95, to 98 percent of every what the old term used to be when under the Cold War, first uh, world were the free countries, second world were the communist countries, and third world were what is now called developing countries. So developing countries, whether you're looking at them in Oceania, like the Philippines, in Asia, in Latin America, uh, in Eastern Europe, and in all of Africa, and we have millions I say we because even though I've been excommunicated, I feel Mormon, and I'm a seventh generation Mormon, so I, I claim that. But there are millions of sub-Saharan Africans in, in LDS church membership, and even though I didn't, was a, unable to get the reports, those developing countries cannot afford to pay for their facilities and the services of the church any more than those in the Philippines can, and probably less. So to me, this is a faith-promoting story that you may wince about a million, or rather a billion and a half being spent on the City Creek Mall, but they were not able to do that without the uh, huge income from tithing and multi-billions each year from commercial income that allows them not only to have these expensive investments commercially, but allows the, the international church to grow and prosper in a way that its local membership could never afford to do. And with that, we'll turn it to Q&A. Oh. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Michael. Um, do you need a refill on your Pepsi? Diet no, I'm, I'm okay. okay. <laughs> I, 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 I know this is my breakfast uh, I know, it's morning, the preferred drink. But no, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you, dear. I have a question about uh, Grant Palmer. Um, I just, in the last few weeks, heard that he has indicated that um, when a general authority is called, that they have a gift of a million dollars. I wonder, A, have you heard that? from Grant, B, where did he get it, and C, is there any accuracy to that? Can you repeat them? All right, the question is that Grant Palmer, in, and I'll expand somewhat on the question, that Grant Palmer, in a posting he made uh, on the internet on April 6, 2013, claimed that he had had a private conversation about six months earlier with a current member of the first quorum of 70 and a mission president, and that this quorum of the Twelve member told him, among other things, that every new member of the quorum of the Twelve, not just every general authority, oh, okay. but uh, every new member of the quorum of the Twelve is allegedly receives a million dollars to pay off debts and to make their, their transition into 24-7 work uh, easier. Um, I share the view of a 
former member of the church who posted three days later his rebuttal to that. Uh, his name is David Tweed. Some of you may recognize the name. He analyzed, uh, he, he, and, and he goes under D David T, but he identifies the blog that he used to uh, edit. And uh, all you need to do is look up that blog and you'll find that his last name is Tweed. Uh, he was summoned to a church court, uh, disciplinary council, um, council of love, for uh, <laughs> apostasy on the basis of things that he had published uh, electronically on, in his blog. And in response to that, he resigned his membership from the church. Hardly a, an apologist for the church. And he began his response to to Palmer's posting three days earlier um, by, by saying, well, just because somebody says things that are not true doesn't mean they're a bad person. And uh, I can say, you know, that's awfully familiar. I mean, we hear that about uh, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and, and a lot of others uh, who are uh, called prophet seers and revelators. But um, David Tweed as David T was saying this as the introduction to his uh, blistering analysis of the claims of, of um, Grant Palmer, who is, and he's a former seminary and institute teacher who um, began publishing uh, works critical not only of leadership and the use of power, which I have also commented on, but uh, also at the foundations of Mormonism, the, the uh, First Vision, the um, historicity of the Book of Mormon, and many other things um, that he has now published in a, in a book uh, on uh, returning to Jesus Christ, I think that's the title, uh, where, where he also includes uh, uh, a lot uh, about his, his negative views of Mormonism from the start. Um, he away. Yes, and he just, just passed just away uh, uh, recently. Um, but historians are not governed by the uh, caution not to speak ill of the dead. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't write anything. Um, so, I agree with David Tweed's analysis that if it were just the claim of a uh, million dollars to each new member of the Quorum of the Twelve, I find that reasonable. I mean, if they come into the Twelve and they are burdened with debts, uh, that would distract them from their attention to the needs, the 24-7 kind of attention that they have to give for the rest of their lives, to the needs of a 16 million church scattered in more than 100 countries throughout the world. To me, that would be reasonable. But that's not where his post ended. His post said that not only did this unnamed Quorum of the Twelve member say that, but he said that all of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve were disbelievers. That took some of them a few years to become atheists, but they were all atheists. <laughs> um, combined with the other outrageous allegations that Grant Palmer puts in the mouth of this alleged first quorum of 70 member. I regard what he posted as a, a, a collection, including of, of malicious lies, including the one about a million dollars to each new general, I mean each new apostle, even though I think that's reasonable uh, if they were in debt, uh, but combined with everything else in his blog, now, whether he was lied to by a current living member of the first quorum of 70, or whether Grant Palmer himself invented all of this out of whole cloth, I don't know. But what he posted, in my view, is a pack of malicious lies. Yes. Yeah, to, close to the one on that side of the bookcase. Okay. 
What do you find is Grant's Palmer's? <laughs> uh, you're going to have to stand because I'm barely able to hear. What do you find about Grant Palmer's historical work generally, such as an insider's more than original? Okay, the question is what do I think of Grant Palmer's work generally, aside from my blast at the uh, posting he made in, on April 6, uh, 2013? I have only read one other thing by Grant Palmer, and that was a series of essays he wrote under the pseudonym Paul Pry in the 1980s, uh, looking at early Mormonism. And I, uh, I found those very insightful and useful and different ways of looking at the, con the connections that I was finding on my own between folk magic and early Mormonism. I have not read anything else of, of, of his since then, uh, but in, in, this is not because I dislike what he wrote. I have, I've had a decades-long rule not and a behavior of not reading anything that I don't need to read for what I publish. And if it doesn't have my name in it, and, and I can look my name up in the index like I did with Greg Prince's uh, biography of Leonard Arrington. Did I say I was arrogant? Uh, I don't read anything. I, I just, I don't. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, there is a very distinguished crowd of authors, uh, both Mormon and non-Mormon, uh, whose publications bo about both Mormon and non-Mormon topics, I have not made any effort to look at. There was another question on the other side of the bookcase. Yes. Uh, in the pink or whatever shirt? Yeah. Um, getting back to the finances of the church, have you, does your research go into how much money is used by the church outside of the church structure itself, building temples and stuff, the donations, the charitable giving outside of their own people? Uh, yeah. Has that changed over time? And, uh, that is difficult to, to assess because the church gave its last report about expenditures in April 1959. And that followed a tradition that had been consistently um, used by the leadership of the church since 1915. And in that year only, the church not only identified its expenditures, it also identified its total income of tithing. And that was the only year. There's a misunderstanding that these annual reports, which many people know continued down to the 1950s, included tithing. They did not. 1915 was the only one who, that did. The rest of them gave total expenditures in a variety of categories uh, that the church made as a part of its mission. And uh, the longest reports were in the late 1940s. And I, have as an appendix in, in the book uh, one of these reports and in the printed form in a, in a format about like this that was called the conference report put out each uh, April and October the April conference report gave the full uh, printing of what was said uh, annually to the membership of the church sitting in the Salt Lake Tabernacle imagine for yourself 14 printed pages of numbers and explanation of those numbers being read out to an audience of eight to 10,000 people for about 15 minutes full of children. And you can imagine what the members of the church had to endure every April conference. So if you think it was a blessing to have that financial report, uh, think again. It, it, the information was great, but to have that droning list of mind-numbing numbers down to the penny in some cases, uh, or rounded up to the dollar in, in most, uh, I'm glad I did not attend very many April conferences to hear that report. Uh, I did attend a few, and it was mind-numbing. But because those reports ended in, in 1959, even though I, by that time they were, were half a page in print. Uh, I can't comment on any trends about the welfare expenditures or whatever. There is one report that the uh, church gave in the 21st century, I think it was around 2011 or 2012, 
that uh, itemize the, uh, its expenses for uh, aid to the poor and, and disaster aid. And that has been highly criticized because it was uh, less or approximately the same as the amount spent as upfront ca up cash expenditure for building the City Creek Mall. The problem is, although that report is, has been accurately reported in the, in the media, it was a report of cash, cash donations to countries or municipalities or <coughs> divisions of government or to the Catholic services, uh, which had a, a better distribution network in Africa than the church could ever have for famine relief. It's cash that that was recording. It was not uh, accounting for all of the blankets, the clothing, the food, the, uh, the items that were non-cash that the church paid and distributed for disaster relief or relief otherwise in, in non-disasters of the poor during that 20-year period. And, and if they had done so, and I wish they had, it would have been a, a greater reassurance to people who would find it to be multi-times. I would expect 10 to 20 times more in value for these non-cash items than the cash that they identified. Um, so that's one of really the only kind of, of measure that I, I have at my disposal for answering your question was that one summary they gave of a 20-year cash uh, outlay for emergency and disaster and welfare relief. Here. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you have any evidence of the businessmen who are administering the, the wealth of the church that they are profiting personally from that? Okay, the question is, uh, businessmen, not general authorities, you mean? Non-general non non -general authorities, who are the uh, directors and the officers of the church's for-profit businesses. I do not have the, the information. But I can tell you what this uh, CFO of the church, uh, Blodgett, said during his uh, uh, period of time in service at the center of church finances from 1965 to uh, 1985 when he left church employee. During that 20 years, he said that uh, the presidents, the CEOs of the church's largest uh, profit-making companies were making double what uh, the president of the church was receiving. And so, but generally, men who, or women, uh, Sherry Dew being an example of a CEO of a church owned company, a controlled company, who come to these positions could earn significantly more if they were in a similar position in the general economy in a business outside church owned. Typically, um, there is a, a, an attitude, which I'm glad that they have overcome to a large degree, that working for the church should be a sacrifice. And uh, it's obvious from the international reports of the bureaucrats and other employees that the church is required to itemize in Canada and in New Zealand and in Australia and in the UK, that although they might be able to earn more outside a church-owned enterprise, they are receiving uh, a significant living in, uh, salary. Although there are enormous differences, and uh, I talk about those uh, that these international reports show, some of which I cannot account for. They're just some countries that have higher compensation for their employees than any comparable con country. Uh, no matter how you dice it, even with the uh, living allowance and the money uh, transferred to similar dollar amounts in, in the dollars availability of that report. Um, so there are disparities and inequalities even within the international church of its employees who are not general authorities. Yes. Oh, I thought you had a question. Yes. Um, the church, uh, you said that they give, gave through the Catholic Charities because they had a better 
uh, distribution <coughs> network. They also do that with the Red Cross. Would it be possible uh, to go to some of these major charities uh, that and find out how much the church has given to those? I can't answer the question, and, and I'll repeat the question. Uh, because the church has donated significantly to organizations like Catholic Charities and the International Red Cross that has a better distribution uh, for its services in disasters than the church could in, in many countries of the world, then when I say the church, the LDS church, uh, is it possible to go to these organizations, Catholic Charities, uh, International Red Cross, etc., and find out how much the LDS church is giving them? I don't know. I, you'd have to ask them. That can be in your book. I'm done. <laughs> Just do one more. Okay, yes. So two quick questions. One, during your research, did you get the impression, or did you come across anything that would support the idea, and I would assume so, that the church provides and helps out those general authorities with transportation, living expenses, or providing an apartment, food, airfare, that kind of a thing, just like the President of the United States. And the second question is, what is your current view of the Book of Mormon? Okay, let's stay on topic. Okay. Uh, I'll answer the first question. Uh, the question was, uh, do I have evidence that the LDS Church central funds, general funds, give support other than the living allowance uh, that is itemized as a uh, equal, equal amount of money from the president of the church to the newest general authority, uh, no matter how low his rank might be. Such things as air travel, such things as housing, such things as cars, um, or uh, other perks. The, the answer I can give you there is, is a little bit muddy because I don't have those kinds of figures. And even when I was looking over the, the uh, presiding bishop reports from 1900 down to 1962, those figures just turned my eyes in their sockets. I, I just couldn't deal with that kind of detail of all of the sources of income and all of the expenditures that these reports annually gave. So what I did in this little Xeroxing I did of documents, I did a, primarily of these financial reports, but I only Xeroxed the pages that showed total tithing received, and, and sometimes they would indicate total revenues, but I could also get that from the, uh, not on revenues, expenditures. And I could very often get that from the annual reports. So typically uh, from these PBO reports, I simply uh, showed the tithing uh, figures that they accounted for. And uh, even though two cents a page was what I would, would need to have paid back in the day, I was living hand to mouth with my wife and our growing number of children and so that was a lot of money to me. And so uh, I took uh, type notes of nearly everything else. Uh, for, for cars, I know that by personal knowledge from the 1960s. There was a, uh, a wealthy um, car dealer named Garf, and I don't remember his first name, but I believe he was the father of the current Garf, who has sons who are now also uh, owning companies. But he uh, gave the uh, members of the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve in the 1960s gifts of cars. And uh, I know that Joseph Fielding Smith, who I had co conversations very often with his lovely wife, who always drove the Rambler around, um, <laughs> he had a Rambler and he didn't want anything beyond that. Uh, some of them uh, accepted uh, uh, higher priced cars, Cadillacs and Continentals, even though they were made by Ford. Um, <laughs> but uh, others who were independently wealthy, like Henry D. Moyle, would never accept that kind of gift, nor N. Eldon Tanner. But those who, who could benefit from that kind of gift accepted it. My guess, and it's only a guess, is that continues today that there are a number, and I don't need to name them, you know them probably better than I do by name, wealthy car dealers in Utah who probably give the same kind of gifts. And now whether they've extended it down to the poor 70, 
I do not know. <laughs> but I would imagine that if that gift giving continues, it, it definitely does uh, for the first presidency and quorum of the twelve. But those who are independently wealthy, like uh, uh, President Uchtdorf, who was a millionaire before he became the uh, general authority that he was chosen to be from Germany, he drives around a Mercedes Benz. I was told. I haven't seen him in it, but that's what I was told. That's his. You know, that's that's something that that's not a gift, and it's not a gift from an individual, and it's not something provided for by his modest salary or living allowance from church funds. Now, as regards transportation, uh, the general authorities, as you can imagine, do a lot of traveling by air. In some cases, they also travel by other means, but typically by air. These are men who are older than I am, and I'm 73, and they uh, have aches and pains that I don't even want to imagine, but I'm probably going to run into. And so they, they, they fly first class. And uh, I, there, there may be some who choose not to, but um, you know the, that's the general rule. And that is pr provided for by the church funds. I don't find that as, as, a, as a supplement to their income. That's something that allows them to have 24-7 lifetime uh, service to the international church and all of its 16 million members. Um, if you find that to be a form of, of income that uh, they shouldn't be receiving, I, I don't agree with you, but uh, that kind of transportation. In terms of uh, vacation homes, the only homes that I know of that are provided for the general authorities are the ones on the top of the gateway, I think it's the gateway, or Eagle Gate, or one of them, um, that is a top floor uh, penthouse uh, with, with bulletproof windows for members of the First Presidency and their, their protection squad, church security, um, their pers personal protection within church security. And uh, as far as I know, that is the extent of that I don't have feel uh, at liberty to identify in any way the uh, this person, but uh, the fa members of the family of a current general authority, a current member of the twelve, told me that when he accepted the call, he took a sixty percent cut in his income, and that his home now is very modest. Um, he does not have a summer home, and it was a home that he bought on. Uh, through the savings that he had made as an independent uh, person prior to um, his acceptance of the call. Uh, there are no, as far as I know, there are no, no vacation homes, with the exception that there may be one for the president of the church. You may or may not know, and I don't even mention this in this volume, I did in, in Extensions of Power, but for many decades, the, from the uh, 1900s down to the late 1960s, the church had a, a vacation home for the president in Oceanside, California. And uh, it was a rest and recuperation location, which the president would use uh, days or weeks each year, but very often unoccupied, but still being paid for its upkeep and the... the uh, staff that was necessary for the upkeep. And they sold that as a part of the cash flow, fri fri cash flow crisis that the church was in in the early 1960s. Now, it's conceivable to me that there may be a, a vacation home or a rest in R&R &R home for the members of the First Presidency. Now, uh, that to me would be reasonable, not from my perspective as a socialist, I've been a socialist since I, my, I came back from England and realized that all the jokes I'd made about English social, socialism, I was laughing at what the New Testament and Book of Mormon urged us to do, and that is to make sure that no one is poor. So um, as a socialist, I have nothing wrong. I have no objection to billionaires in an economy. It's just that there should no, be, in no country should there be the poor people who have one meal a day on average for their family. Um, but if, if a person through their resources can become a millionaire or a billionaire, 
that's fine as long as they pay 90% uh, tax rate, which is what Republicans <laughs> charged the wealthy during the 1950s when we had a Republican Congress and a Republican president, and the tax rate for the very rich was 90%. And I wish we could go back to those good old days, those Republicans who talk about going back to the 1950s. Um, anyway, I, I, I can't answer about other kinds of, of supplemental income that you mentioned. I only know those details about, about what I've mentioned. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's give my hand.